meetings this week to our um, team site just in case you know someone didn't get a chance to attend or you just need a refresher or you weren't sure about some of the material and you just want to watch again you hire someone new someone comes back from you know being out so all of those things will be possible and then um, at the end of class today everyone that received these invites will get an email from me directing you to the new PNG Coupa site which all where all the material is at as well as you guys are going to receive a copy of our handout material so part of today's presentation will be from the handout material and that's actually what you'll receive a copy of at the end of today's class so um, for those of you who I haven't met or haven't attended other classes my name is Nikki Beersdorfer. I am a regional director here at Penn National. Um, I oversee several five properties, and as you can't tell, the Coupa rollout is part of my uh, my job. Um, I have been in Coupa for about five years now, and this will be my 14th uh, cutover from a Stratton Warren Red Rock system to a Coupa system. So it's pretty exciting. And uh, I think you guys are absolutely going to love it. The visibility is kind of insane in terms of what you can see, what your end users can see, um, and just the use is pretty amazing. So uh, before we jump in, I am going to share my screen with you guys. Um, during the presentation, if you have questions, if you can just put them in your conversation box, I'm going to to keep an eye out for that and answer your questions kind of as we go through the presentation um, and then if I don't know the answer to your question I will make sure to get you an answer and all of the questions and answers will actually be posted on our team site under the FAQ channel for your reference later on so I am going to share my screen here really fast um, in a second you'll be able to see a PowerPoint called Coupa rollout if someone could let me know when that's up and visible, that would be fantastic. I can see it. Sweet. All right. So um, we're going to go over kind of here's our here's our agenda for today. I will tell you some of this detail um, references warehouse. This is not a warehouse training. This is very much um, a finance kind of focused training. We do go over some of the finance items necessary for warehouse operations, but basically the entire last half of today's class kind of just goes over some Coupa basics that are very financially um, kind of specific. So um, that is what we're gonna, gonna go over today. Uh, the rollout obviously includes a lot of different things, but since we're expanding to Coupa, and as you guys I'm sure know, Oracle at the same time, um, there's a lot going on right now in terms of the transition. I think the good news for me at least is that we have properties operating today in Coupa and we know how it works and we have a lot of the setup already done. Um, so when we go live in January, I'm not guaranteeing that there won't be some hiccups for sure, um, but I think we're very prepared for that um, and prepared to support you guys as you go live. So in our training today, this is kind of the outline timeline. We are actually right in here. And so um, next week we actually get into a lot more training. So buyers are gonna start training. Um, Jerry Lynch at the service center is gonna start his AP training for all the AP folks out there. Um, uh, warehouse training started this week and continues into next week. I'm actually going to be in Las Vegas next week um, teaching some warehouse people how Coupa works in person. And so that's all kind of going on right now. As you can see, we also have a bunch of communications going on, which I'm sure you guys have gotten some of those this week as well. And then we're also starting our cutover prep, which uh, really kicks off next week and your properties will start to have um, weekly cutover meetings to kind of talk about all of those tasks that are more property focused. Um, your procurement folks are actually heading that up, so they're getting their kickoff meeting on uh, on Monday or Tuesday and then uh, the weekly meetings will start after that. So we are starting kind of the last little leg of our go live transition. Have any questions so far 
or we're going to move into kind of a Kupa overview. All right. So the Kupa overview basically just gives you some benefits. Well, some of these are warehouse focused because we are kind of talking about the financial piece of warehouse and some of the training today. Every one of our classes goes over the benefits specific to the user group. Um, all of you will be invited to end user training in January as well. So you'll be able to see that. You'll be able to see how your end users are trained. Um, you yourself will be able to get trained on placing orders and things like that in the system as well. And so um, just in terms of the benefits, um, I will tell you it's probably one of the easiest user interfaces that I've ever worked with. It's very intuitive. Um, it's It's been equated a lot to like the online shopping experience. Um, and so I think that that's probably the easiest way to describe it. It's pretty amazing in terms of just uh, you don't have to necessarily teach someone 47 five digit commands to be able to do their job anymore. So that I am very thankful for because I can still remember Stratton Warren commands from years ago. They're imprinted in my brain. Um, key changes. So we have a couple of key changes. I'm not going to read all of these. Um, you guys are going to get a copy of these as well as um, you can read them yourselves because they're on the screen. But I will kind of talk through some of my favorites. Um, I am a huge fan of moving to a single chart of accounts, um, mostly because right now I have uh, five properties, four of which are on different chart of accounts. So um, I can't remember an account number to save my life at this point. I always have to look them up. So I am going to be extraordinarily happy about a single chart of account structure. Um, the next thing is management hierarchy approvals. So currently in your systems, um, you can you can do a couple of different things, but primarily in a Stratton Warren Red Rock environment, it's done by account number. Um, so if you put an order in for the buffet, it routes to the buffet approver. If you put an order in for facilities, it routes to the facilities approver. Um, in Coupa, it actually routes based on the manager. So if I put in an order, it is going to always route to my manager. Um, this has a couple of really um, key benefits for us. It's a lot easier to maintain a management hierarchy approval structure when you're talking about 40 properties and like 4,000 users. Um, it's also really easy for the end user to know who they follow up with because it's never going to change. It's always going to be the same person that their orders go to. Um, so that I think is really great. And later on, I'm actually going to show you guys how users are set up. So you'll be able to kind of see how Coupa handles that structure in the system. Um, the last thing on this one is uh, I don't know how many of you are using Suexa tables, but those go away. Um, in Coupa, it actually gives your the person placing the order complete control over the GL code that the order is charged to. So that is a huge part of our end user training in terms of really stressing ownership on their end in terms of making sure that their GL codes are correct. And then the last thing on this page is the invoicing. Um, huge fan. It uh, Coupa is a procure to pay system, meaning it kind of everything from start to finish, the finished part being invoicing. Our suppliers will have the ability to get their own portal to Coupa, manage our account through that portal, submit invoices electronically. Um, it really streamlines the whole process and it is so efficient in terms of making sure invoices are in the system in a timely manner, um, seeing the invoice there, making sure it gets processed correctly. So that is actually pretty amazing. And then this is mostly about warehouse key changes, just so you guys can kind of see some of um, the pretty cool things that they're going to experience. The one thing on here that I would say is great is delegates. I don't know about you, but um, I have many times in my career gotten a call from an end user saying, why is my order not approved yet? Only to find out their approvers on vacation and didn't do anything about it. Um, in Coupa, uh, your approvers actually have the ability to go in and set a delegate for when they're going to be out of the office. Meaning that if I was going to go on vacation, I could assign my approvals to someone else while I was out. Um, to answer potentially your next question, the system will stop me from assigning someone who has less approval authority than I do. So that is pretty cool. But these are all kind of some of the big key changes we're talking about. Um, the buyer one is three and a half pages long, so a lot of key changes for different people, but this is the ones we wanted to talk about today. And then um, I don't see that we have any questions, so if you guys are ready. I'm actually 
show you Koopa and we are going to talk about adjustments. So um, the first thing for adjustments that we need to kind of understand is how they work. So I'm going to show you a pretty brief process overview. Um, so this is kind of how adjustments work. Now in Koopa, adjustments are not just taking things out of inventory when they have spoiled or damaged. Um, an adjustment in Koopa is actually a few different things. It is potentially a count variance. So either you're doing a small cycle count or an entire warehouse count. That's technically considered an adjustment in Koopa. Um, if you are returning something that has been received into inventory back to a supplier, as in, hey, I ordered too many cases of mayonnaise and I want to return them, the supplier is going to take them back. That is an adjustment out of inventory. Return to warehouse. So if one of my end users is ordering too much, they have a slip of the finger, two people are ordering for the same outlet and they happen to order too many items and I want to take that back into inventory, that is an adjustment. And then spoilage and damage, those are also adjustments. So these are kind of your hands. Um, this is handout material. Um, some adjustments and what they are, how to use them, et cetera. So when we talk about the process overview, the warehouse will always start the process and then finance will finish it. So this is labeled IPC. That stands for Inventory Process Clerk. That does not, that's not an official title of anyone. It's literally just someone from finance that you assign to do the task. Um, it's important here that there is a separation of duties. So this person does have to be outside of the warehouse, um, but that's about the biggest thing we have to learn here. As you can see, the warehouse does a, does a request the, I, the, the person that is assigned to that reviews the request, make sure that it's it makes sense. If they do not have approval authority, so if they are not a manager or above, they will need to get approval. Here we use the example of you know a director of finance, but they just need approval of someone with approval authority. You guys can assign this as necessary, and then after they get approval, they make the adjustment in Coupa. So. I have a couple of examples here in terms of what the emails would look like. This deck is also going to be shared with the warehouse team members so that they have this in their kind of repertoire to use as a uh, as documentation. But each one of these, this is kind of the three examples that they'll use no matter what count variances are done during the cycle count portion. This is basically everything else. So out of inventory is spoilage, into inventory is a return, out of inventory is a return to supplier, right? So relatively easy to, to write. Once the uh, inventory or finance person receives this information, they will go into Coupa. So a couple of key things about Coupa, this is Coupa test. So you guys will actually receive access to Coupa test today. And um, you'll be able to go in here, play around. Um, I don't guarantee that your access and your approver and all of that things will be correct, but you can at least have a good idea of what the system looks like. If you want to practice some functions from today, um, you can kind of go in and start playing around. It is cloud-based, meaning that you do not have to be in a network, you do not have to sign in a network, and you do not have to VPN in to use it. It is pretty amazing. So you just need this nice email address here. I will be sending it out later. Coupa Live works the same way. And so when we're in Coupa, today I'm actually going to be acting as Rebecca, and she is our controller here in Blackhawk, so we're looking at her access. And to start an adjustment, we are going to go to the Inventory tab, and we're going to stay on the default on-hand balances tab. So this actually shows me all of my warehouse items that I have a balance for. Not all my warehouse items, just the ones I have a balance for. So I can see through all of these what my on hand, what my quantity on hand is, how many are allocated out or on order for departments, and then how many are available. So once I get the email from my supplier or my end user, I can literally type in a keyword and find that item um, or I can use the advanced search feature and this gives me a lot more options. We'll go over that later. So in this case, I'm actually going to show you how to 
um, return something into the warehouse. So we talked about the three different kinds. Now to do an adjustment, there is the adjust inventory button. Do not use this. This is, you can, but there are a lot of variables you have to select. There's a lot bigger chance of making a mistake. So for ease of use, I always say use the wrench over here. The wrench is key. We love the wrench. So we click the wrench and then the process for any adjustment we talked about is the same one. You would hit the wrench, you would come into the adjust balance. And then this is where you would select the type of adjustment you are performing, either spoilage, return to warehouse, or return to supplier. In this case, we're gonna return this to the warehouse because apparently my bakery ordered three cases of yeast and they only needed one. So I'm actually gonna return two here. In this case, the change in quantity is how many I am bringing into the warehouse is always a positive number. So if I'm adding, information uh, that is where I would add if I'm removing so if I am returning to a supplier or if I'm spoiling out I would actually put a negative number here and that'll actually deduct the case count from my inventory on hand balance in this case we're going to do a positive number um, this is for assets etc you don't necessarily this is not required for this what is required is this little attachment section down here. So in the attachment section, there's two things for return to warehouse. The first thing is the approver. So if I need an approval, I would get that approval and put the document with the approval in here. Now I can either drop the file and drag it and attach it, or I can browse my computer or Teams or wherever, and I can select a document open it and it attaches here. This is an audit trail. So you don't have to keep the actual paper document. You don't have to keep emails in a folder for three years. Um, this is where that goes just to kind of make sure everything's in one place. That is true for all adjustments. So whether it's a return to supplier or return to warehouse or um, a spoilage, the approval needs to go here. Text field. So the text field is used for spoilage and return to warehouse. The reason this is used is it gives our friends at LVSC some information about what type of return this is. So if it was spoilage, I would put my spoilage account number here and hit add, and then that would also be in the record. Since this is a return to inventory, I'm actually gonna tell them what account this is being returned from. So how that works is return from bake shop. And then I would type in the account number and I'm using the current account structure for Pinnacle or the Pinnacle account structure here. But you would put in the new account structure and this lets them know where they're actually taking the money from so that at the end of the month, the accounts balance and we actually don't end up charging the bake shop for this. Once we put our notes here, you would hit save and then our you can see is immediate and we have now adjusted in our inventory. So that is how adjustments work. Now our next um, our next topic is cycle counts. So for cycle counts in your handout material, we have kind of a suggested SOP for you guys. Um, this is kind of walking you through a full inventory. Um, I will tell you whether you're doing a smaller inventory or an entire inventory, all of the steps are exactly the same. So you don't have to learn two processes. This just kind of goes through what the warehouse would do, what the warehouse would do, what the finance person would do. Again, the IPC is just whoever from a finance site is assigned to this task. The team itself would recount together and then the final count would happen and then that kind of walks through. We do have a note here that it should be completed minimum quarterly. That's obviously up to your department SOX requirement. So if your property does things differently, you can necessary. This is in here and we do have kind of a, an overview of what this looks like just for some visual people. And then I'm actually gonna show you how it works in Coupa. 
So a cycle count would basically be going to inventory. You are going to stick your to your on hand balances sheet. And then for those of you who may have access to more than one warehouse, this step is particularly important, but I would recommend doing it regardless. Um, and that is using the advanced search to ensure that I'm only looking at the warehouse that I am performing the count for. So I would use the filter, select the warehouse and hit search. And that way I am just guaranteeing that I'm not about to pull potentially other inventories into cycle counts. Now, this is really the only step that kind of goes back and forth is if you're gonna do a smaller cycle count where you're just doing like an aisle, an area, a cooler, a freezer, um, a type of item, this is where you would make that selection. If you're gonna do a full cycle, select every item. So if I was gonna do a full cycle count, I would select, select all 394 items, and then I would hit the send to cycle count button. For speed, we are not going to do a full cycle count today, so I'm actually going to clear the selection and I am honestly just going to go and we're going to pick a random kind of six items. So I'm going to send these to my cycle count. So once I select the items, I send to cycle count. It's going to give me a green bar saying good job. You've sent your items to cycle count. And then once we get the green bar, we are going to go to the cycle count tab and we are going to select all of our items. So the only items in this list should be the ones that you just sent here for the record. Once you select them, you are going to start your cycle count. And then it's going to bring you to your cycle count sheet. So this um, is kind of where we actually perform the count. This sheet is reorganizable. So if you um, need to organize it by commodity or location and you just want to organize it a different way than the default, you would use the pencil button. Then you would use the sort by sort it a specific way. Um, I like to do warehouse location because then the sheets are kind of shelf to sheet. It makes counting super easy. Once you're done, you'll hit save. And then the system is going to kind of pop you back to the cycle count sheet. You can see all of my history is here. So if I just want to see the one that I'm currently working on, I could use the advanced search field, use created date is today and hit search. And then it's actually going to bring me to my cycle count. I'm going to click the cycle count number, print this. You can see it does give areas for signatures for audit purposes. Once I print, me and my team are going to go count. Um, when we're done counting, the finance person is going to sit here and enter um, uh, numbers. And I'm guessing well, they're going to enter the actual counts. They are going to enter the counters. So whoever counted this will be um, the counters today. We add the comment, so now it's still an auditable item, and then we submit. It's going to ask us, are you sure? We're going to say, of course, we're sure. And then the cycle count is now submitted for approval. The next step is this, is having the warehouse supervisor um, approve this. So in this example, Nikki's the warehouse supervisor, so I'm going to go to the inventory tab. Um, I am going to go to the cycle count tab because we want to actually go to the cycle count itself. Go to the list. It's going to bring mine up because I have a search bar in here. I'm going to select and it's going to tell me we counted six items. And lo and behold, we have six discrepancies because we guessed. So in this, it will tell me what my discrepancies are. So that's really important um, because it will actually go through um, it'll kind of give me an idea of like, hey, this is weird, something's off, um, and you can kind of look at it and say, that's really weird. It looks like we're 48 cases below vodka and we have an extra 46 cases of rum. Maybe we counted those wrong and we just moved the numbers on the sheet. The recommendation here is to always 
recount all of your items with a variance. So how we would do that is we would assign all and we could use one of these, the count variances the most, and we could finish the count right now if we wanted to. We could all, we could assign them all to count variance and we could, and then would we, we would be done. Obviously we talked about the recommendation being to actually recount this. So to do that, each line would be selected as a recount. There is not a mass feature to do this, unfortunately. So um, less variance is the better. And you would select, and then I would say, please recount. I would approve. And this way, we are actually going to send those items back to recount. Now you can see this is now complete and the record is here. So I can not only see how many I counted, but my actual discrepancy lines so that if I ever needed to audit this, all that information is in the system. So to restart my second count, I would actually just click the cycle count button. All of my items are still here, so I don't need to go back to on hand balances and select again. They automatically end up in this screen. So I'm going to select all again, and I'm basically just going to start the cycle count. Same thing, right? It's basically going to give me the same options. I'm going to, you know, reorganize if I want it the same way. Once I'm done, you can see we have an in progress cycle count. And we can go through here and basically type in our recounts. Once we've recounted, we write down recounted both Rebecca and Nikki counted. So that's both warehouse and finance counted together. We add the comment and when we're done, we submit and we say we're done. So that being said, it does go back to the warehouse supervisor for approval. So we go back to list of cycle counts. We can see here is our count. And this time we have no variances. So it doesn't actually require approval. It is now complete. If it did require approval, you would follow the same steps. You would click on the discrepancies. This time around, the warehouse person would research those discrepancies, try to figure out why they happened. If there is a discrepancy of $1,000, they would notate that in the comments, why it happened, what their research kind of discovered, and then they would work with their finance person to ensure that all of that information was fixed and correct in the system. So in this case, this is how cycle counts are completed and um, do you guys have any questions? So if I wanted to print these out, I would just go to the cycle counts, list of cycle counts, and then I can click and print as necessary if I want to keep a paper record or if I want to save them as a PDF and keep them on a file somewhere as a separate record for audit. So that is our kind of finance focused warehouse section. Um, we're actually going to jump into um finance basics next so our finance basics section um it's really just about letting you guys know kind of how documents are um created how gl codes are done um tax freight capital and uh reports and getting data out of coupa so i think those are all pretty cool things the first thing we're going to start with though is how users are set up so in Coupa, you actually have the ability to see how a user is set up. You don't have the ability to change it, only corporate IT does, but you do have the ability to see it. So under setup, you will get a users button. You will select, and then you can actually search your users. So today we're going to actually look at Rebecca McCauley. Um, you will not have these icons. Um, I do just because of my access and test only, but I'm gonna click on her name and I'm going to be able to see how she set up. So I can see her licenses. I can see the roles she's given. I can see her default information, her additional attributes for her account. I can see her approval settings. So I can see who she reports to, who report to her, and her approval limits. So this is always really cool, um, specifically if someone's like, I keep placing orders and they go to the wrong account, I don't know what's happening. Um, 
why do my orders keep going to so-and-so? I don't report to them. This is a great place to go to start that process in terms of getting the approvers fixed. The next thing is default address that automatically defaults them, shows what warehouses they have access to, um, their content groups. So a lot of people will only have access to one or two and then what billing securities they have access to. So this keeps them from being able to charge other properties for their stuff. So they will only have access to their own property general ledger code. So I think that's pretty neat. So that's how users are set up. Now, um, I want to show you guys how user information is defaulted. So I am actually gonna go back to setup and uh, for this purpose, I'm actually going to act as Rebecca. And so I want to show you guys her setup since we just looked at her user access. So when Rebecca places an order, so whatever she places an order for, whether it comes from a punch out, which is the websites, an internal catalog, which is set up, or she free text something that's weird, um, we are going to kind of show you guys how the GL code defaults in her in her cart basically. So we're gonna select an item, we are gonna change the quantity and add it to her cart. So now that she has some stuff in her cart, we're gonna go and we're gonna scroll down and I wanna show you guys her, her defaults. So this is where it defaulted. Now the property code comes from her user. The department, which as you guys know in the new general ledger code will be one number. Um, instead of two here, that will be defaulted from her user information. And then the GL code back here will be defaulted from the commodity selected at the item level. Now in, in Coupa, it does kind of have some intelligence to it. So that's how it defaults. In this case, you can see it's highlighted red. Um, Coupa is telling me that I do not have access to the food cost of goods sold account, which is this, for my finance department, which would make sense. So it's asking me, hey, this is definitely, we know this is definitely not an account you should be charging to. I'm gonna need you to go fix that. How to fix these. They don't have to highlight in red to be wrong. They just, that's the intelligence behind Coupa. If it knows you just shouldn't have access, it highlights it. You can change if you know they should be charged more. The choose an account feature, it gives you this section, which then you can search using names of accounts, account segments. Once you search and find something, um, it will kind of allow you to select. So in this case, you can see there's a lot of different accesses from this division. I'm going to say that this is my, I'm going to charge some water to employee relocation expenses, which we all know is incorrect, but I'm going to do it anyway. And notice the red goes away and Coupa's like, Good job, you charged it to an account you know. So this is where we really stress during end user training how important it is to uh, update and watch your GL codes because it is changeable at a at a cart level. So are there any questions about that? All right. So the next thing I want to go over, and this is right before we get into like pulling mass data out of the system, is how documents are kind of set up in Coupa. So it's really important to know the setup to be able to search and to be able to perform accurate searches and get the right data out of the system. So today I'm going to focus on invoices, but they're all very similar in terms of the structure of a document. So in this case, um, I am going to be in the invoices column. I am going to kind of pick a random invoice for us to look at. I'm going to select the invoice number. And in the invoice, in any document, this top section right here, so everything I'm going to highlight above lines is considered header level information and it's applicable to the entire document. So the document status is pending receipt remit to still distributing in Shreveport. Invoice number is a document number. So all of those things apply to the entire document. Net terms, the department you ordered it to, the property, that kind of thing. Now, when you get to lines, 
all of the information honestly be separated by line, so it can differ by line. Obviously, descriptions, quantities, prices, commodities, general ledger codes. So you can have multiple codes on one invoice, on one purchase order, on one requisition. Um, they don't have to be all one GL code. So all of this information can kind of be separated by line. Now, it's important to know this because Coupa bases a lot of its search parameters on header information versus line information. And that's really apparent here at the invoice and line section. So the invoice section, which we're on now, focuses a lot of information on the header area. So the advanced search feature and all of these filters are a lot more header focused than potentially line focused. Okay, so it, it definitely pays to know the type of information you have and where in the document that fits, whether it's a header info or a line info. From the line invoice line section, the advanced search feature wholeheartedly focuses more on, and you can see a lot more options because there's a lot more information in the line level that can be changed. So this gives you a lot of like line level info. Now, both of them work the same way in terms of Coupa has some preset views showing you specific information you might want to see. Now, anything that you see that starts with a number here or a property name has been created by us. A lot of these are Coupa specific pre-created views. And basically all the view is, is it just kind of sorts through this information. So instead of seeing every invoice for everyone in the company, if I just want to see invoices that um, don't have POs attached, I can do that here. Something you guys will have to keep in mind is you'll be able to see everyone's invoices. So in order to make this data more meaningful, you have to make sure that you are using a department, a GL code or a property number to kind of manage your data. That can be done in the advanced search feature here where you dictate whether it's the accounting company code, which is useful. I would say personally, I really like to use the billing stream or the account number. And the reason is, is because it not only will catch items that are being done at my property, so the ones we're doing, but if I use the billing stream, it also catches any invoices that are being done by the corporate office that are being charged to me. So that data can be more inclusive for you guys when you're trying to pull data out of Coupa. So that's kind of how the view and the filter kind of work together um, and the difference between these two sections. Now, I don't know about you, but I do a lot of random, weird, like help me find this use, help me find these invoices. How often is this person doing this? What's the cost? What's the average? All of that kind of stuff. So um, one of the things that I learned to do a long time ago is the Coupa default, um, like the Coupa default views give good information, okay? But as you can see, it's limited information. It usually is only five or six different columns of info. And so while this is useful, I, I know a lot of times I have to have more than that. Like this is not extraordinarily helpful for me. So one of the things I've learned to do is use the creative view section. And so what creative view is, it's accessible to everybody. At every view section, all the way at the bottom, there's a create view. It allows you to kind of create your own data table so you can view whatever data you want in Coupa. Now, it's limited by the section you're in and whether you're in header or line details. So that's why that's really important to understand the information you have, where it fits in the document, and the information you're looking for and where it fits in the document. So that kind of allows you to pick the section and then build a view from there. 
every time you build a view, these are going to be your options. So you'll name the view. I like to create views for myself called ad hoc. This is basically just a view that only I can see that's called the ad hoc, as you can see. And I basically use this and restructure it every time I need to do like a new one off search. So that's kind of a personal best practice for me. That way I'm not creating 40 different views for one time searches like that seems kind of silly. So I really like to do this and then these are always editable so you can go back and just change them over and over and over again. Um, so I really like to do that for myself. Um, and then there's always the option of creating a view that is just stagnant and no one changes. So we'll go over kind of some of those options. And when you're creating the view, the visibility feature is really important. So only me means just me. So only Nikki can see this. I love this because it allows me to create whatever views I want, whatever data I need to pull, um, and that is really helpful to me. Now everyone means literally everyone. So in Koopa, everyone means everyone in Penn National will be able to see your view. There are almost no reasons for any of us to use this button. So my advice is don't. In this one though, I think is semi-useful. And so I really like restrict by content group, specifically if you're creating a standing view that's gonna help um, manage documents, manage an action, um, remind anyone to do something. I really like the content group because it allows you to restrict visibility to just your property. So you can't do it by department. You can't do it by like selected group of people, but you can do it by property. So in this case, we're gonna um, select Blackhawk. And that is going to allow this to just be visible at Blackhawk. So at least I'm not like making those view lists ridiculously long. And then the start with view, this allows me to take some of the pre-created views that Koopa has made and start with those restrictions. So this part along with the conditions is all about structuring what information is going to be in your view. Whether you are restricting information, so whether you just want to see approved non-PO invoices, or whether you are excluding information, which that comes a little bit later. But these are all about really just modifying and condensing and choosing what information you'd like to see in your view. Now, once we pick, start with, and if we don't, you just start with all, and then that's all data. Then you get into conditions. This is virtually endless in terms of your ability to pick and choose and exclude and include and, and things like that. So you can see these are all of my different options in this particular tab that I have available in my view. Um, and I can literally go through here and pick any of these things, pick a filter, the type of filter I'm applying. So again, you can be very specific, you can be broader, you can exclude data as well. So this is really important in terms of how you want to use and what you want to see. Um, once we pick information here, so I'm actually going to pick a billing stream and I am going to say the billing stream just contains 082. Anytime you are building a condition, it is very uh, recommended that one of your conditions is something that identifies your property. Whether it be an accounting code, whether it be a billing stream like this one, I love this one because it does again catch everything I'm doing as well as things that other people are charging me outside my property. And so this kind of helps capture my property. If you don't limit this to your property, you're potentially gonna see data from other areas, which is gonna skew some of the information you're looking at. So this is kind of a very simple filter. You can add additional filters. So you can see I can add, I think you can add like 20 of these, by the way. You can also, they default to filter and filter and filter. You can change it to or. You can also group conditions where these would be ors and these. You can also switch it to and or these. 
So again, if you look at all of this kind of add and take away and add take away, the possibilities of what you are including is is endless. So here are some here's the that's how the conditions work. Once you've selected your conditions, so right now we're virtually going to say I want anything with the billing stream of 82 and I'm going to delete this other section and I'm going to say and I want. Um, I want invoices that are basically. Uh, pending approval, I want to see who's holding up invoices. So that's one way there's other sections in the system which you'll learn about later. But that's what I'm going to condition this to. Now, my columns is basically what info do you want in your view? So you've already restricted the data that it's going to look at. Now you need to tell it what info you want. So the columns, here's everything available. And this, these are long, you guys. Again, endless, endless options to pick from. So all of these are, are data that you can have in your view. Um, this is the available, this is the selected. So anything in the selected is going to end up in your view. And they are in order of column in Excel. So if you ever export this to Excel, invoice number would be column A, supplier would be column B, and so forth. To change or select, it's virtually just drop, drag, drop, drag. Okay. Once you have the selected columns, I can go down here. I can decide how they default in sorted order. Again, we're just talking about ridiculous options. Once I've selected, I hit save. Holy crap. I already have that report, so it does stop you from creating the same thing multiple times. I'm going to rename it and then I'm going to go back down and I'm going to attempt to save again and it will save it. So here is everything that is included in my initial report and my initial view. Couple things, if this is not right, if I notice the data looks weird, sometimes I'll create reports and nothing shows up, so I know that's weird. Um, you can edit these and like I talked about, I always have an ad hoc that I literally just go in and create like one off data sets that I need to export. Um, so in that case, you would just click the edit button and Basically, just go in. You can change anything you want. You can get rid of, type scratch. Um, and then once you're done, you can change these two and you get a couple options. You can change the header name and then save this as new if you just want to start with a base and then modify to create a brand new. Or like I did here, you can change everything about it and hit save. And then this is going to be the new data set that you're looking at. So that is how views work. Um, now, if at any point I want to export this information, so as you guys know, this is just raw data, right? In and of itself, it's maybe not going to tell me a whole lot if I'm trying to um, do an analysis, if I'm trying to look at you know anything in terms of how many dollars I have pending approval, how many dollars I have here, how many dollars I have here. So there are, this is basically just raw data. If I want to manipulate this into maybe of a more of a reporting structure, I can export this into Excel into, I mean, anytime I want. So I can just pick, it's going to tell me, your file's really big, we're gonna email you that data. And then depending on two minutes, you'll get an email in your now, if it's a smaller, if it's smaller data set, so if it's 10, 20, 30 items, um, I'm going to use the advanced search feature to see if I can kind of show you guys what that looks like. Supplier contains. Um, I'm going to look here. I can see relatively small data set. Let's say I still want this in Excel. I can export and it's actually going to give me a little pop up. This is my data. So once Excel opens, here's my data. Now it's in Excel and I can manipulate it any way I can this, I can send it to others, etc. So that's one way to get the information out. The second way through is setting up a report. 
So to set up a report, you have to have a view of the data you're looking for, and it has to be this view. It can't be a combination of this and this. So once I have my view determined and I know this is the data I want to look at, I select schedule an email button. It gives me the report. I can name it however I want. I can add recipients to this. I can choose daily, weekly, or monthly. I can choose the run window, specific standard, watch that. And then I can choose the type of report I would like to see. So that's actually really helpful. Um, and then if I am using the view to help me just monitor things. So as an example, I know here in Blackhawk, our controller actually has a report that is set to only look for purchase ordered issued in the last seven days that exceed a specific dollar value. And she does that so she can obviously work on our financial reporting and her future predictions in terms of where we're going to end up at the end of the month. And so she does that so the system will automatically send her a list if anything like that's created. Now, in this case, let's say we don't issue any large POs that week. She can click this button and the system just won't send her the report. If there's nothing to send on the report, if there's something to send, it'll send it to her. You can click and unclick this as you want to see the data sent to you. And then you hit save. Once the doc's created, you now have a report out of Goomba. To check your reports, you would go to settings. You would go to reports. It will actually tell you all of the reports that you are included. Here's the here. And of everything that has been sent out. So you can see if it actually got sent or not. So you can see here this failed, but all of these were done. So that gives you kind of like a little a little history of where you can go to find all that. So that is a lot of the basic Coupa information in terms of kind of how all of those things work, reporting, views, um, that kind of thing. So the next thing I want to talk about is accruals for a second. Um, accruals, as you guys know, are very interesting part of our process. Um, I actually help do accrual research every month. One of the most common mistakes we see is people over receiving. So in Coupa, you're going to have purchase orders that are called SPOs or standing POs. They are to help us and monitor all our spend to a specific um, activity over the course of the year. An example would be utilities. So we know in, you know, in 2020, we're going to spend about $1.3 million on Excel Energy here in Blackhawk. So we would actually create a PO for $1.3 million and then every Excel invoice that comes in gets charged to that purchase order. So we can not only track, but it's also consolidated. It matches a document. We know that it's a pre-approved spend. There's some backing document history in the system explaining what the spend is, why it's there, if it has been bid or not, if we have supporting documentation, if it's contracted or not, all kinds of reasons to do it. But what we find is sometimes our end users will go in to receive that bill to say, yes, this is OK. I did receive $200,000 worth of electricity this month. Please pay that bill. Sometimes we will see that they receive the whole PO. So as an example, and I just I will show you guys this just for example purposes. Um, as an example, they could go in and mistakenly receive a very large purchase order, um, which, you know, it happens. Um, we do have a video on the website to actually show people how to do it correctly. So in case you've experienced this, you can be like, hey guys, go watch the website, it's okay. So this is how they receive, like let's say I have an outstanding invoice for $200,000. I would literally have to type in the amount and then receive it. A lot of times they'll hit this all button. Notice it just changed it to half a million and then they receive the whole thing. So that's a relatively common. It's a lot more common the first couple months they're in the system. Once they've made this mistake and they and they see that they have a million dollar charge for electricity, it kind of, you know, spurs their thinking and they're like, oh no, that that's not good. 
Um, so you'll see it a lot at the beginning, but this just needs to be voided. It can easily be corrected um, and you can contact um, your procurement partner department to help correct those. But that's a that's a kind of a, a common issue. Um, just to let everybody know, we kind of want to warn you guys about that because you will be seeing your your financials for the first time and those a couple of those things might pop up. Um, questions so far, I don't see any, but I just want to make sure. We have a couple more minutes, and so I just I want to show you guys the handout material and go over just a couple more things. Um, tax and freight. So everyone's kind of doing this a little different right now um, in Coupa. Uh, tax and freight do not go on requisitions. They do not go on POs. We do not create lines for them. We don't track them that way. PO and tax, uh, tax and freight is actually handled at the invoice level. So when a depart, when a person or an AP clerk or a vendor is going to enter the invoice, there's actually this whole section at the bottom of the invoice where their tax and freight goes. So they will enter it here and not on the PO. So if your buyers do get a request like this, which I know a lot of our end users enter them like this because that's the information on the quote, um, your buyer will actually remove the tax and the freight lines and only include the actual items on there on the requisition. So that's one thing that may or may not be changing for you, but we do wanna make sure to go over that. And then the last thing is capital orders and kind of the approval chain. So in Coupa, um, the capital actual project funding um, will be handled by finance um, and you're going to get some information from corporate finance on that. Um, but once the project is approved and the project number is assigned, the project number will be available in Coupa for selection. This basically just a requisition for a capital order. So there's a couple specific areas, change the department, monitor capital orders. They select capital as yes. Only time in the cart they do that. Every other time is no. And then at the end, there's this whole section in your cart for capital. The only one your end users are going to use is this project number, and then it'll actually give them a drop down to select from and it will be approved projects only. So that's how they designate capital at the header level. And then there's a couple things they have to do at the line level. They do have to change the GL code to the new um, construction and progress or their new capital GL code. This is the new chart the example. So just not to confuse people, we did use the new chart of accounts. And then at the individual line detail, they will actually be able to select the project and activity code. So that's done at the line level so that if they are ordering something from one supplier and it happens to bridge activity codes, um, they can select that information at the line level. So this just goes over how that's done and then in the approval chain, they will see that there is a system approver this is an automatic approval. It's not an actual person. It's actually a robot approver. And basically it just goes through all the things we just talked about and make sure that they all kind of jive um, and they're all completed. And then once it identifies that all of the items necessary are there and completed, it'll auto approve. So just to let you guys know, it's definitely going to be there. The approval chain is uh, then just like it normally. So that is uh, capital orders um, in Coupa, and those slides will also be included in the end user training it is an appendix item for your end users to reference um, as they capital orders going. So we are right at an hour. I just went through a ton of information. Um, but before we finish, do you guys have any questions that I can answer for you? Wonderful. All right. Well, um, thank you so much for joining me. Oh, here we go. How is the project number obtained? That information is actually going to come from corporate finance. So I am not, um, I know the project number is created in Oracle. Um, but I'm not privy to those exact details. 
Um, but that information is actually going to come from your corporate finance team during the rollout information that's shared. But you'll be happy to know that once the project number is obtained, it like it automatically gets imported into Coupa. So that's not a manual process by anybody. All right. Any other questions that I can help answer? How do you guys like it? Does it does it look interesting? I'm going to take no feedback is good feedback. Oh, good. Thanks, Bernie. <laughs> so this is Coupa. Uh, this kind of inventory control and some finance basics. I hope you guys had a wonderful time. Um, I am going to be sending you guys some info um, after today's class with all of your handout material. And it looks like I just got another question, so I definitely want to make sure I answer that. Um, Oh, good. Yay. Hi, Sarah. Thank you very much. It says that she's been pulling invoices when doing intercompany entry, and she says the search features are fantastic. I love to hear that. So that's one of my favorite things, too. I think you can find anything you're looking for in Coupa. Um, it does take some getting getting used to, right? Because there, as you guys saw some of those lists, like there's so many options. <laughs> Sometimes it's a little overwhelming. So um, I'm happy you guys could come today. You guys are going to get a copy of the handout material so that you have that to take with you. It's going to be saved on our Coupa channel. Um, any questions from today, any questions from other classes, including warehouse training, buyer training, AP training, end user training, all of those questions are also being entered in that FAQ sheet. So if you are interested in other people's questions and the answers, you can go there and kind of just see what people are, are wondering about. And uh, thank you very much for your time, and I hope you guys have a good weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I've been